Whether Midas ever met Silenus again or not is unknown to the teller of this tale. But another, and an even stranger, adventure was in store for him, as you shall hear. One summer eve, as he rambled among the pinewoods of the valley, he came to the edge of an open glade, where a company were sitting, whom he instantly perceived to be other than mortals. That troop of beautiful girls, so tall and slender, with their green robes and wildflower garlands, he knew must be nymphs of the woods and mountains. They formed a half circle, and the other half was a band of shaggy, gold-legged satyrs. And that grand figure seated in the midst on a fallen tree trunk, gold-legged also, but with superbly molded body and a countenance in which mirth and melancholy were strangely blended, that was the god Pan himself. His pipe of reeds fitted together was in his hand, a shepherd's crook lay beside him, his large, mild eyes were turned towards a fair-haired youth who stood a little apart, leaning against a pine stem and holding a harp. So much Midas had seen, when he was himself observed. The youth with the harp strode forward and, pointing with outstretched arm, exclaimed, What man is that, yonder, who dares to spy upon us? Instantly the nymphs sprang up and stood at gaze like startled deer, the satyrs leaped to their feet and rushed upon Midas with angry cries. But the deep voice of Pan bade them forbear. Hold, my children, said he, laughing, let the man alone, for he is friend to a friend of ours. Come hither to me, King Midas, and fear not, you are welcome for Silenus's sake. And now I bethink me, here is an umpire for us, Apollo. As you will, answered he with the harp, in cold, clear accents, though methinks your nymphs and satyrs were better judges of our music than a mere mortal. Nay, they are partisans, said Pan, merrily, and all for the flute and pipe, as your muses are all for the lyre. We are in Phrygia, said Apollo, the home of the flute. The Greeks, mine own people, honor the lyre as it deserves, but this barbarian can know nothing of it. The better, the better, oh, harper! Pan replied. You will have the more credit by your victory. What, was it not a greater triumph for Orpheus to tame the beasts of the forest by his harping than to draw iron tears down the cheek of Pluto? I verily think so, and let me tell you, when I am among those Greeks who are my people, even the shepherd folk of Arcady, I have more joy in piping unseen for their delight than you can feel when your lyre charms all the company of heaven. You speak as a child of earth, returned Apollo, disdainfully, but I am one of the Olympians, the heaven dwellers. Your ways are not as our ways, nor your thoughts as our thoughts. What should you know of our joys? Yet, heaven dweller, said Pan, and now his voice was solemn music, you and I, and all the immortals, and the whole race of men, are of one family. The gods in their strength, men in their nothingness, come alike of one mother, holy mother earth. Who knows it better than you, wise lord of Delphi, that possessed the secret place of her oracle? Despise not, then, the homely shepherd god. Apollo smiled. Nay, he said, far be it from me, I know his powers too well. And I myself have played the shepherd ere now, in Thessaly. Yes, said Pan, smiling also, and the flocks of Admetus so throve under your tendance that he deemed you the very pearl of shepherd lads. But let us to this contest. It is yours to begin, since you are the challenger, and do you, Midas, listen well to both, for you are to judge between us. Then Apollo, taking his stand in the midst of the glade, struck with a golden quill one great preluding chord upon his seven-stringed golden lyre and began to play. The beams of the setting sun made a glory round his fair head, his long, white robe, such as minstrels wear, fluttered a little in the evening breeze. And as he played, not only Midas, but Pan and his woodland company, listened entranced. The lyre quivered like a live thing under the touch of the god, he seemed to be drawing forth from it the voice of a soul in ecstasy. Divine bliss, divine peace, were in that wordless psalm. It lifted the hearers into another world, serene and changeless, whence sorrow and sighing had fled away. And then the god's own voice mingled with the appeasing, gracious harmony. He sang of Zeus, father and king of the Olympians, with whom began the reign of law in earth and heaven, whose wisdom sweetly ordereth the course of all things and then of the divine power of music, which is one with order, and binds together the fabric of the universe. Oh, golden lyre, he sang. Oh, treasure of mine and of the muses, thou art a symbol of the mighty world, for the whole frame of things is a mystic harp, resounding eternal harmonies under the finger of gods. As Apollo ceased, 
the last rays of sunset faded and the woods were veiled in purple twilight. Midas could see only his white robe glimmering in the dusk and, beyond him, a ring of shadowy forms. There was deep silence for what seemed to him a long while. He felt afraid to speak. But he thought, this, then, is the glorious minstrelsy that the gods here in heaven, at the feasts of King Zeus. There can be naught to equal it, my judgment shall be for Apollo. And then, out of the deepening dusk, came, faintly at first, the notes of a shepherd's pipe. Yes, that piping sounded faint and thin at first, after the melodious thunder of the lyre. But soon it rose in piercing sweetness, like the skylark's carol, and now it was like the liquid warbling of a nightingale, and now like the sound of many waters. Sometimes it breathed a heartrending sadness, sometimes the lilt of it made the pulses throb with the rapture of mere living. All the beauty, the mystery, the terror of life, were revealed as in a glass darkly, by the piping of Pan. It died away in the gloom. Was it Pan's voice that Midas then heard murmuring? Your chilly stars I can forego. This kind, warm world is all I know. He could not be sure of that, or of anything, for some moments. He was like a man in a dream. Pan's piping, he vaguely thought, was like the singing of Silenus. Speak, mortal, came Apollo's voice. Are you for my music or for Pan's? We await your judgment. Glorious son of Zeus, answered Midas, in trembling tones. I give it for Pan. I listen enthralled to your celestial lyre, but the melody of his pipe is yet more ravishing to mine ears. Then you have the ears of an ass, cried Apollo with a burst of mocking laughter, or deserve to have them. Ah, ha! A king with ass's ears. There was something so terrible in that laughter that Midas turned and fled out of the glade at his utmost speed. What is this outlandish cap, said one of his tavern friends to the chief butler, that the king has taken to wearing? What is it? Why, it is a cap, to be sure, replied he, testily. Other men wear caps, I believe. Cannot the king wear one, but all the idle tongues in the city must begin wagging? Nay, be not offended, good sir, said the townsman laughing, but when he wears one of a fashion never yet seen in this country, it is enough to set folks talking. Especially, put in the tavern keeper, as it is said he wears it night and day. When I heard that, I said to these honest gentlemen, the worthy chief butler is the man to read us this riddle. Riddle? There is none to read, I tell you, cried the chief butler, with irritation. Here is much ado about a piece of headgear. One would think the king had got the cap of darkness, like Perseus in the old tale, by the way you talk. I dare say, now, you have never seen this cap you make such a clatter about. That we have, said the townsman who had first spoken, and I can describe it to you. It is a high cap of soft felt, tapering upwards into a peak that curls over a little in front, fitting close to the head, and completely covering the ears. The chief butler fidgeted in his seat. Well, he snapped, what is there so marvelous in that? It has pleased the king to invent a new shape of cap, and I say, it is a handsome shape and convenient wear for all weathers, and as for your calling it outlandish, you will see it worn shortly by every man in Phrygia, if they are not all asses. He seemed to choke upon the word. But I have no more time for idle chat, he added hastily, so good day to you, my friends. And he marched out majestically. What has ruffled him this morning, said one of the company. He loves gossiping as he loves tippling, but today he seems in no humor for either. It is his conceit, said the tavern keeper. Since the king took him into such favor there is no bearing with it. A beggar on horseback, my masters. I wish I had asked him, said a young townsman, if it is true that the king never takes off that cap. Well, old pomposity could tell you that for certain, said the tavern keeper, laughing. The king has made him his barber, you know. Next time he comes, we will ask him if his master is shaved with his cap on. But after that day, the chief butler kept away from the tavern and shunned even greetings in the marketplace when he went there, which was as seldom as he could. His fellow servants remarked that, from the most talkative and sociable of men, he had suddenly become the most silent and morose. The truth was, the unfortunate man was bursting with a secret which he could only keep to himself by doing cruel violence to his natural instincts. A born blabber, no woman could revel more than he in the luxury of repeating a confidence. With him, to be told a secret, 
no matter how important or how trivial, was to know no rest until he had betrayed it to at least half a dozen people. These betrayals were quite aimless, and, in a sense, involuntary, secrets might be said to dribble out of the man like water out of a leaky pitcher. And this foible of the chief butler's having become notorious, the only confidences made to him for some time past had been, as even he felt, too paltry to be worth retailing. But now, here was he possessed of a tremendous, an astounding, secret, and he dared not breathe a word of it. No, though his whole being craved for the relief of telling it to somebody, to anybody, he simply dared not, visions of what would happen to him if he did made his blood run cold. If I once let slip this thing, he thought, it will spread like wildfire, it will come to the king's ears, Shaw. How came that word in? And then I am a lost man, for he will know that none but I could have betrayed him. The chief butler was thus in pitiable case. His secrets so burned within him that at times he felt a mad desire to shout it aloud in the streets of the city. It obsessed him, he began to feel himself hag-ridden. Impossible to drive it from his mind while he saw what he had to see every day. After his last visit to the tavern, he grew afraid of talking to anybody, so nearly had he then yielded to the force of old habit and let his fatal knowledge escape him. Ah, what a temptation it had been to stop the chatter of those ignorant blockheads and set them gaping with astonishment. One sentence would have done it, one little sentence of five short words. He could hear himself saying those words, soon, the sound of them rang perpetually through his dreams, and he would wake in terror, believing that he had really uttered them. And day he went about with a dreadful sense that they were on the tip of his tongue, at any moment he might simply not be able to keep them back. At last, he could bear it no longer. In the dead of night, he stole out of the palace and went to a lonely part of the river bank. There, in the darkness, he threw himself down among a bed of reeds and, pressing his lips to the moist ground, whispered those haunting words. Then he scraped a handful of mud over the spot and rose up with a sigh of relief. I am rid of it now, he muttered, and the king's secret is in safer keeping than mine. Dead earth can tell no tales. But even as he spoke, a sound beside him made the chief butler start and pause. He tried to think it was only the rustling of the reeds, swaying in the night wind. What else could make that odd sound, as of people talking in whispers? Only the whispering of the reeds. But it seemed they had human voices. Oh, gods! What was this they were saying? In a frenzy of terror, the hapless chief butler plunged into the river and sank like a stone. And the reeds, swaying in the night wind, went on whispering together, King Midas has ass's ears.